Welcome to the Macmillan <coughs> Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Andrew Hill, the J. Clayton Stevenson Professor of Anthropology and Curator of Anthropology in the Peabody Museum at Yale. Professor Hill is interested in the whole range of human evolution, specifically in the environmental and ecological context in which it occurred. Since 1968, he has carried out field work in Eastern Africa, in Pakistan, and in the United Arab Emirates. For many years, he has directed the Baringo Paleontological Research Project, a multidisciplinary research program operating in the Tugan Hills in Kenya. This ongoing work was the topic of a special double issue of the Journal of Human Evolution in 2002. And in 1999, he co-edited Fossil Vertebrates of Arabia. Today we talk with him about the climate's influence on human evolution. Welcome, Professor Hill. Thank you very much. You have done extensive work in the Rift Valley in Kenya as part of the Baringo uh, mm -hmm. Research Project. Give us an overview of some of your findings and what's come out of there. Hmm. Well, uh, let, let me start by just saying why I'm doing that. And okay. Might be good because uh, basically what, what I'm interested in is the, the changes that have taken place since our divergence from our, our nearest ancestor. Mm -hmm. It's generally agreed now that the chimpanzee is our nearest living, nearest living relative. Okay. And that we diverged from the line leading to the chimp about seven million years ago. Um, and I'm interested in the changes that took place along our own lineage, the mm -hmm. one that we refer to as homonyms. Okay. And uh, these are among the things that make us uniquely human. Uh, things like bipedalism, we walk on our back legs, which is a really odd thing to do for animals other than birds. Mm -hmm. And the fact we have a really large brain uh, that's, that's really strange. And that we have culture of various kinds, including material culture, whether they're you know, hand axes or iPhones. You know, okay. This is, again is something very strange. And uh, it's th these are stages in our evolution along that line. And it's generally held that such changes uh, are sort of encouraged or produced by ecological shifts and changes in environment that cause animals to become adapted to different circumstances. And so basically what we're doing is looking for that along that lineage. Okay. And the reason I work in Kenya in the, uh, the Tugan Hills is that there's a succession of rocks there in the hills that goes back to about 15 million years from now. So you cover the whole of human evolution mm -hmm. and apes before them. Uh, and there's fossils all the way through. And so it enables you to find the fossils and also to find indicators of climate and climate change. And so that's really what we're doing there. Um, in the course of that, we found some interesting hominins. We mm -hmm. found uh, what was for 10 years the earliest hominin. And, and let me interrupt yeah. and, and tell us what is a hominin? Well, a hominin is, the, is the, the, all those creatures forming that branch once we've diverged from chimpanzees. Okay. So it's, it's those that are sort of exclusively. And uh, at what housed. point in time did that happen? That, that probably happened around seven million years ago. Okay. And the assumption is that it was bipedality which characterized that change. Okay. But that, that's the general idea at the moment. Okay, and we're, let's get into that because <coughs> that's one of, the th one of your findings is in terms of the environment and when hominids started walking on two feet. Right. So, Tell us about that. Well, the, the, the idea, given that it's such a strange thing, and it's always been used to sort of define the mm -hmm. group of, of animals we belong to, um, there's been a lot of interest about that. Sure. And th there's a kind of uh, story that goes back a long way, even almost to Darwin, uh, that it was something to do with a big change in environment in Africa uh, from a forest, essentially a forested environment that was mm -hmm. all lush and green and lots of forests everywhere, to increasing aridity and the growth of grasslands and the savannas come on the scene mm -hmm. and then uh, an ape gets on its back legs and starts to wonder what to do with its hands and uh, it never struck me as a very good theory because there was no there was no real reason why savannas should provoke this right. although it's it's a nice myth mm -hmm. um, and uh, gradually I, we found that that idea has been eroded over the past decade or so and how did you find that um, Partly because in, in the whole succession where, where we, that we're looking at, 
there was no signs of grassland, and there are a number of ways in which you can look for that, and we, we can talk about that in a second okay. if you like. Yes. But o other things is that all the all the very early hominins that have been found now that now go back to nearly seven million years are seem to be associated with with woodland environments and not these sort of uh, sort of ideal uh, Serengeti-like grasslands that, that that most people think Africa is like. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so the evidence from, from and you can do this from, the, the reason you know they're associated with woodlands is because the animals that are there, you get things like colobus monkeys that live in trees and eat leaves and so on, mm -hmm. and various antelopes that are very specific to woodland conditions. Um, and, and there are various other ways of looking at it. And one way that we looked at it was to look at carbon isotopes in soils, in fossil soils. Mm -hmm because it turns out that the different carbon isotopes indicate different kinds of vegetation and that this is preserved into these little nodules that form in soils. And it gives you an idea of the sort of vegetation that was growing at the time. So um, you can detect closed woodland sort of vegetation uh, 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 and also grasslands. And okay. the grasses that are in hot, open conditions have a different way of doing photosynthesis. And this is what you can detect by looking at these isotopes. Okay. And what we found in doing this, it was, it was mainly someone else who did this, but I was involved with it, um, is that there is no sign of these open grasslands that you would otherwise expect at any point, all the way through from 15 million years to now. And it's all a more mixed signal with woodlands, sometimes forest, and mm -hmm. so on. So. so basically, it was woodlands, forest kind of an yeah. environment yeah. when hominids <coughs> came into existence. Yes. I, th I think this is what's happening. Okay. Which, which doesn't solve the problem of bipedalism, of course, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> gives you a lot right, of right, more right. options. Um, well. Let's talk about climate change and, and astronomical effects. Mm. Originally, you didn't think that astronomical effects um, really had an effect on the Rift Valley. Right. Yeah, the, the, a, a very interesting idea came, came in. Uh, gr gradually, it's been possible to detect past climates, by, again, by various isotopic mm -hmm. means. And a lot of this has been done through cores, through deep sea, deep sea cores from uh, drilling vessels. Mm -hmm. And by looking at, for example, oxygen isotopes, you can get an idea of sea temperature. And this is clearly something to do with climate. Mm -hmm. It's also been found to do with astronomical variations in that the, as the Earth moves around the sun, it wiggles in various ways. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of, th these are known as Milankovitch cycles that okay. people probably have heard of. And th there are these various wiggles that operate at various periodicities. And they, um, they're basically, it's a, they're very complex, but the simple thing is that th what they result in is different parts of the Earth facing nearer to the sun at different times mm -hmm. in the past. And this affects how much sunlight is hitting the Earth in those places. Mm -hmm. And this is what seems to drive major climate change. Okay. And you can pick this up from things like the oxygen isotope record and okay. see that this is actually happening. Uh, and and, and pe some people have begun to say, well, this is what's driving things in the Rift Valley where hominins are living and around there in Africa. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with it was these effects are less strong at the equator for various reasons. And the, the other thing is that they, they uh, uh, it, it struck me that the environment locally was so dominant that it's a very topographically diverse area, the Rift Valley, with mm -hmm. big cliffs and, and uh, volcanoes, that it's going to be local things that is affecting weather rather than mm -hmm. major global things affecting things. But I was wrong, as it turns out. In fact, one of the amazing <coughs> things I learned in, in reviewing your work is um, about the monsoons and how you could actually tell how much rain had fallen yes. in any given period and how these ginormous lakes formed. Right. Ginormous <laughs> is my scientific. It, they are ginormous. <laughs> I agree. That's the word for them. Um, so tell but us, tell yeah, us about no, that. Yeah, th this was bit. sort of a surprise because, uh, as I said, I, I had convinced myself that what we were observing there was essentially local. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, w we, we began to notice that there were repeated things that are known as diatomites. They're mm -hmm. very white rocks. And they, they form in lakes, and they, they form from the sort of little skeletons of blue-green algae, microscopic algae. And they die, and they just sort of rain down onto the bed of the lake. And they're very pure. There's like 99% of these things are these little silica remains of these creatures, or plants, or whatever blue-green algae are. And they, um, there's very little input from outside. Okay. And uh, so they're very pure. They're beautifully stratified. 
And we saw a succession of these in the area we were working at around two and a half million years. And we had this thought, what if this is precession? Because this is one of these little Milankovitch cycles that operates as a 23,000 year cycle. And if these were responding to changes in, in the amount of sun hitting the Earth at that time, uh, th this is what you might expect. And I, a lot of people have seen cycles like this, but without being able to show that they really were to do with this astronomical cycles. Mm -hmm. And they can be due to all kinds of things, like changes in little lake basins and so on. Um, but we had someone who was able to date these things incredibly precisely and show that they occurred every 23,000 years, mm -hmm. which is exactly the time period of precession. And then there are people, not me, but there are people out there who understand these cycles extremely well. And you can actually get on a web page and find out how much sun is hitting the Earth anywhere at any time in the past. And so we were able to do this for the period concerned and uh, produce this little graph that goes up and down and shows how the, the amount of sun increases and then gradually mm -hmm. decreases. And the dates for these were exactly where we found the lakes, right on the top of the very abundant sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite clear that that's what's driving this. And then, so that since then, we've been able to go further back into the past where you also have these little packages of high sunlight and also find evidence of lakes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a recurrent. An amazing thing. It's a recurrent thing, yes, yeah. and I wouldn't have thought we'd have found mm -hmm. something that. So, that how exact. has the climate change affect evolution? For instance, I, I remember reading that you had these big lakes and then virtually they would vanish relatively quickly. Yes, very quickly. That must have some kind of. Yeah. Effect. I, I think the, the I mean, I, I, I think it's wrong to hope that there's sort of some simple connection between mm -hmm. sort of bipedalism or making stone tools and lakes. I mean, this is naive. But the, the point, the, the, the real thing that impresses me about this is the fact that we now know that these sort of climate changes aren't local. And mm -hmm. it, they, these filled the rift from side to side, and that's 60 kilometers across. I mean, they're huge lakes, and we, we can work that out as well. Um, but it's not local. And so mm -hmm. even in places where you don't have these obvious lakes, you're having similar climatic effects. You wouldn't expect the lakes everywhere because you don't have situations for lake basins, but there is an analogous climatic effect operating there all over Africa. And they operate cyclically, and we know they go way into the past, um, and you can predict when they are. Mm -hmm. And this is happening everywhere. And I think that the thing that impresses me about it is that we now know that Africa wasn't a sort of constant environment for a long, long period of time with perhaps one change and then another. Mm -hmm. we, we know that there's this sort of pulsing uh, okay. business. And, and that's normally what's thought of as driving evolution, is change that breaks up vegetation and breaks up environments mm -hmm. for animals. And, and is so that on. kind of what you're getting at when you use the word kaleidoscope yeah, effect? Yeah, that that uh, I don't know whether that's effective, but it, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it struck me it was like every now and again, quite suddenly, and, and quite often, really, every million years or two, um, you're sort of shaking up the whole environment, like as if it was in a kaleidoscope, mm -hmm. and things are dispersing um, and getting isolated in small pockets here or having to go somewhere else. And then quite quickly they come together again, but it's a slightly different pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of structure that you need for just Darwinian natural selection to right operate right. in. And you've been able to find actual evidence of that happening? Well, we, we're, what we're doing now is looking at the animals because we have a good a good evidence of faunas all the way through. And we're monitoring uh, faunal change as you go through these climatic shifts. And mm -hmm. we, we don't have any direct hard evidence yet, but we're, we're getting there. We're, okay. we're looking at that. Wonderful. That's our next thing. Yeah. Um, if you could go back, travel back in time to the time of the hominids, what would you most hope to oh, be able to see? That would be nice. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's one thing. OK. Uh, because the, the thing that's sort of irritating about, about this subject is that um, it, it is a science, and I, I would defend that in front of any white lab coat person, but it is a science, but it's, it's about the past. Things that nearly everything you're looking at has already happened mm -hmm. in a long time ago. And there's no real reason why we should expect to know anything about what we were like in the deep past, but we happen to because of a few rare fossils. Mm -hmm. and but what it means is that the, the obvious questions people would ask, uh, you can't answer. You know, how many, what, what did this look like? Mm -hmm. Was it furry, this ancestor? Right. Did it have red and blue mm -hmm. patches on its face? 
uh, what was the group size? Was it five or 50? You know, you don't, you don't know these. What is it eating? Right. Whereas an, a modern ecologist can go and watch a panda and see it put bamboo in its mouth. You know. And I think that if you could get back there, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be looking for one thing. You'd just be impressed by mm -hmm. everything. It'd be like going into a, a game park remote in time where you could see everything happening. And you'd have so much more information if you could do that. That would yes. be very nice. It would be. Maybe you can get me a time machine. Yes, I, w <laughs> I wish I had one. I wish I did. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing some of your, your work. It's been fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more information about Professor Hill and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you.